this is the last lecture before we have a small short discussion and the the only lecture to deal with uh, chondral lesion probably you know for a um, knee surgeon for an arthroscopy surgeon uh, a very important topic to deal with so i'll talk about you know some of these lesion how we usually tackle uh, at the very outset i'd like to say that um, i am very much inspired by laszlo hongoti who is basically the father of the mosaic plasty i met him uh, credit goes to rajiv raman when i was faculty in kolkata you know <laughs> or limb course so i met him so since then uh, probably that is a turning point when uh, the mosaic plasty has become main workhorse of my practice so coming to the osteochondral deficit this is a multifaceted complex you know the chondral lesion is, is not just a chondral lesion it has so many aspects like when when we talk about chondral lesion either it is a focal defect or it is a diffuse cartilage diffuse cartilage injury that has to be you know really understood and explained uh, uh most of the time what happened uh, osteochondritis desiccans which is basically of a adolescent disease is also con considered as a, a osteochondral defect uh, which is little different uh, and it has to be treated little differently so whenever we find out a, a lesion uh, we have to think on that line also either it is a desiccans or it is not uh i will talk a uh, little bit of few slide about the status of the subchondral bone which is so important uh, and then a lot of emphasis is given to the subchondral bone at this moment uh, age of the patient is very very essential and crucial to decide what type of treatment you are going to institute grade of injury there are various classification i'll not go into that but we know that grade 1 and grade 2 relatively conservative grade 3 and go grade 4 injury of the cartilage requires more aggressive management uh one of the major factor to decide what type of treatment should be instituted in the chondral lesion is the size of the defect so uh, we have few slide on that as well and last but not the least the functional demand of the patient is again a crucial factor so these are the more scientific factor uh, to decide how to address the chondral injury but the less scientific factor uh, is the personal experience so the availability of the various modalities of the treatment of cartilage is one of the major factor that will also determine you know what type of treatment you are going to institute to that particular patient uh, to that particular patient uh, in my context especially in nepal we live I, we are in the low socio economic uh, condition where you know money is more weighted uh, than the disability and pain so people will you know tolerate their disability they will tolerate their pain uh, but they would love to preserve their money and then to tell you very frankly the newer advances of cartilage treatment are uh, very costly and beyond the you know approach of majority of my patients uh, so my uh, presentation will will have this component in choosing the uh, best treatment of this patient so coming to the cartilage treatment first and foremost we have to identify either it is a diffuse cartilage or it is a focal one so if it is a diffuse probably your treatment is going to be on a non surgical initially you give certain medications ha injection prps and the various growth factors mesenchymal cells are coming up and you are looking at at some point of time you are looking at uh, a total joint replacement uni replacement or even a high tibial osteotomy in this type of and this group of patient so major focus of today's talk is basically the focal uh, lesion uh, which requires a surgical fixation usually a uh, fixation chondroplasty oats and various cellular mesenchymal stops like aci uh, various growth factor and a uh, little bit i'll talk about the bmac so i i would like to emphasize this is not a new concept this has been uh, floating around for uh, last uh, 10 15 years the concept of osteochondral unit <clears throat> so what this says that if you look at the cartilage only so you are looking at the tip of iceberg there are so many things underneath that tip of iceberg and that underneath is the subchondral bone so we should not look at only the cartilage we have to think about subchondral bone this is the concept of the osteochondral unit just to elaborate on that if if you compare this cartilage the whole osteochondral unit with the, with a person sitting on chair 
the articular cartilage is a person who is sitting on the chair and the chair is the subchondral bones so if you see that if your subchondral bones or the chair is not healthy then the articular cartilage will not hold for a long time so that is why what i have learned uh, over a period of time from you know so many experts is that whenever there is a chondral injury we must evaluate the subchondral bone so you should not treat a chondral lesion without evaluation of the subchondral bone if there is a damage to subchondral bone it has to be addressed and there are two ways by which you can we can address the subchondral bone there is only oats you can use a plug uh, of um, oats in which you will have a cartilage as well as the subchondral bone and the the length of these uh, oats can be determined uh, depending upon the what is the what is the amount of loss of the subchondral bone the other thing is if you are using aci or other mesenchymal cell devices for uh, you know for chondroplasty then you have to bone graft that subchondral bone so that your cartilage sits on the healthy uh, subchondral bone uh, coming to the second important one age of the patient is very very important as we all know that the vasculature or the you know blood vessel crosses the physis and it also crosses the tight mark uh, and come right up to the subchondral region uh, to provide even into the cartilage uh, some portion of the deeper portion of the cartilage to provide the vascularity. So what it says that it has a well vascular. The pediatric or the adolescent cartilage are more vascularized. Uh, that is why it has a good healing and the regeneration potential. But when you decide treating or fixing all these kind of things. You also have to think about physis, the distance of the physis from the injury. Uh, whereas in adult, there is no physis. You can pass any devices which can cross even the physis. There will be not an issue. So this is an example of a 14-year-old male. Uh, he had a recurrent patellar dislocation. I think this was uh, this was his fourth uh, fourth uh, dislocation. And after fourth dislocation, he had extension lag. He was having pain. Uh, difficulty in walking and you could see that after uh, about two and a half months of injury as well he was having certain amount of effusion uh, the patella was you know dislocated last week. so this was his mri you could see that uh, his uh, cartilage is uh, you know ripped off from the condyle and it is just underneath the meniscus of the anterior horn. so this was underneath that so since this was just 14 year we decided to do an arthroscopy and plan so this was his, uh, you know, uh, the crater, uh, which was about um, 2 by 1.5 by 1.5 centimeter. And there was a loose body, which was a mobile. Uh, it was just uh, on the posterior next to the popliteus tendon. We removed that uh, cartilage. You could see that this was about 1, 1.2 centimeter uh, uh, cartilage. This was big enough for this boy. Okay. But this was not having any uh, subchondral bone. So this was a pure chondral defect. Although, uh, you know, chances of healing if you repair this chondral defect is, you know, higher. But uh, to repair this, you may require certain devices which may cross the physis and will have some growth disturbance. So, in this 14-year-old guy who had a physis you know, intact, we decided to do a microfracture. So, microfracture is a very simple technique and, uh, you know, probably... Uh, again, this is underrated. Uh, there are a lot of reports coming of its good result and bad results. So it depends upon so many things. But the microfracture for a very young uh, child is a, is a good idea to take. So to do that, you have to deprive all the you know adhesions from the crater. Uh, you can do a micro drilling or you can use a small sharp you know microfracture owl. Uh, the main important is uh, you start from the periphery and gradually go towards the center. I'm not going to all these things. You can see that the periphery has been drilled and the, I'm drilling on the, I'm doing a microfracture on the center. What is important is to make sure that these are, you know, now have not gone into the, um, into the physis and these are bleeding now, you know. So what you do is put your shaver uh, into the crater, suck it out and then slowly you uh, let the fluid go inside the joint and you'll see that these all holes were bleeding. So that is how that good is a, a vascular supply into the subchondral region. This kind of vascularity is not, you know, seen in the adults. And then we did a, um, a stabilization. We always do a superficial quartz technique. 
So the portal level is stabilized and you can see in three months time, the guy was walking up about and then he was not having um, any problem. And he hopefully uh, his uh, results are going to be good. And it is said that for a younger kid, uh, the results of micro fracture are better than the uh, really adults and old age. This is another case. Um, uh, this is another case um, of 18 year old boy, uh, who is again a very young one. He was playing football actually, and then uh, uh, came to us with uh, one week uh, history of uh, knee pain, and then we, uh, you know, scanned him with the MRI, and we could see that there was a big defect of the cartilage. So since it was very fresh, uh, we decided to uh, go for surgery. Uh, it was only one week away from the injury. So we decided to go for surgery. You could see that this is from the right from the lateral condyle uh, from the edge. I'm sorry that I don't have video of this patient, but we were able to, you know, although it was displaced and the fragment was lost into the uh, lateral gutter, we were able to uh, perfectly reduce that fragment and we decided to fix it arthroscopically. So we fixed that with arthroscopically. We don't have a biodegradable screw, so we use a Herbert screw in that patient. And you could see that uh, fixation of this patient was uh, possible because his uh, physis has already closed. And you can see that this is his uh, three months follow up. You can see that some features are healing. And the more importantly, uh, he is symptom free and he's able to do so many things at the end of three months of his follow up. So, oh, the important message in younger people uh, repair or fixation of the device. And even micro fractures are the good choice uh, for the treatment of these acute injuries. Uh, I'll have an extensive little more slide on osteochondritis desiccans. Uh, it is completely different from the normal uh, osteochondral defect by virtue of it etiology, by virtue of its classification, and for the treatment purpose as well. Although both uh, traumatic and this type of uh, you know, desiccans is classified into four types, but this is completely different. I'll not go into detail of this and bore you with this type of um, you know classification design. But what important thing is, type one and type two are undisplaced. Type three it's and type four hours. are type three is loose, and type four is completely displaced from its crater. So, what is the treatment protocol for this patient? This type of osteochondritis desiccans in my patient is I divide them into two groups: type one and type two, and type three and type four. Then I'll talk about either his physis is open or physis is closed. If the physis is open and it is type 1 and type 2, that means your fragment has not displaced. I will conserve. If the physis is closed, I'll do a drilling, multiple drilling. Either it is retrograde or enterograde. I usually do an enterograde. That means through the, uh, through the desiccants, which is more, you know, focused and precise. Many people do retrograde drilling also that will preserve the cartilage that is the opinion but the literature has, says that there is no difference in grade three and four when this fragment is unstable either in the crater or it is displaced from the crater again if the physis is open and the fragment has subcondral bone then probably you have to try to fix it out with certain devices maybe a smaller type maybe a small thin pin or whatever devices you can fix that but if the physis is closed then you consider that patient as an adult and treat uh, as per the adult. So uh, some of our, you know, experience, this is a grade two osteochondritis desiccans in 21 uh, year old college student. He was having this problem for very long, you know, uh, which was, uh, he, he was having normal x-ray uh, for last uh, two and a half years. He's been roaming around here and there. Uh, and, and the diagnosis was done only after the MRI scan. So MRI scan said that this is an osteochondritis desiccans. You can see that the classical appearance of the osteochondritis desiccans of the medial femoral condyle. So we decided, we thought that this is grade uh, 3 or grade 4. This is just lying in the crater. So we decided to do an arthroscopy. And to our surprise, in arthroscopy, you could see that there was a bump kind of stuff of that portion. And then it was very much stable. So we uh, we tried to move this uh, we tried to move this uh, fragment with various devices. You know, we used probe, then we used more robust instrument, try to identify either it is stable or not. So since it was uh, two of the operating surgeons, they confirmed that this was stable. So we decided to do a 
uh, when we are drilling. In this case, we did a uh, anterograde drilling. That means from the from the osteochondritis desiccans to the bone. So this was the process. I'll not go into that one. We all know how to drill that. So again, from periphery to the towards the center, uh, and this time we use a, a you know sharp um, K wire to drill through that. And I'll if I can just go. Oh, okay, I can just go there. So to cut short, so this is the completion of the drilling. You can see that multiple days. And fortunately, uh, this patient did very well. And we have a MRI of, uh, of this patient, which says that grade two after this kind of drilling has healed. This is another example of grade three. Um, again, a 19 year old school uh, student, again, having knee pain for uh, multiple years and even with this uh, X-ray feature uh, and the MRI done for him, he was neglecting because he was not having severe symptoms. So once started having, for last three, four months, started having severe pain with which the patient came to us. And this was his MRI, uh, which was done elsewhere. Uh, and the MRI shows that uh, there was an osteochondritis desiccans. What we did was uh, we did an arthroscopy. And then look at the difference between the previous one and the, this one. So when we probe, it was just floating, you know. So this was this was classic uh, grade three. Although you do not see a classical breach, you know, not separated, but this was not holding into the subchondral bone. It was just floating. So we decided to open it up, take out the loose cartilage. And after cartilage, this was the defect the patient had. And then we decided to do a mosaic clasty. In this particular patient, since this is more localized towards the, you know, medial side, the most medial side towards the notch, we didn't put any mosaic on this part. We put little sparse mosaic in this particular case, uh, and then uh, the patient uh, healed uh, really well, and he was not having any problem. The final one was the great. Four, uh, grade four one. See, see, this patient comes with so marked osteochondritis. Desiccans, again, a 19 year old boy having two, three years of all this problem, but left undiagnosed or untreated. When he came to us, uh, he came with this MRI, which was done about. Um, six months ago but when he he presented uh, he presented to us with the history of locking of the knee so he was not able to extend his knee completely so we thought that this might have displaced we we uh, we wanted to do a repeat mri but the patient refused to get an mri done so we decided to go inside and when we did an arthroscopy the fragment from the posterior condyle has displaced entirely you know so this is the whole uh, cartilage is a big piece piece about about two by three and then there was a big bone piece also as you could see in the previous so you could see that there is a big bone piece it was not possible to reduce arthroscopically so we decided to open it up and then we removed this fragment which is very big we were not able to reduce it we were not able to take out arthroscopically so we decided to do a formal arthrotomy remove this and this is uh, the cartilage uh, articular part and this is subchondral part you could see that good amount of subchondral bone was there. Uh, with a little bit of pie, pie crusting on the medial side, we were able to open up the joint line. And then after opening the joint line, we uh, we did again the same fixation by the open technique. So uh, this, was, this was after the fixation. You could see that this is immediately after the fixation. And this is about um, three months down the line. And you could see in even in the X-ray, there is a features of healing and the patient was doing really well. He is walking well. 
there is a full range of motion of the knee joint and the powers of the left knee also have gained. Uh, but this is just three months follow-up, we are still to come. Another important issue I would just like to touch upon is the knee alignment in cartilage repair. We all know that at this moment, whenever we attempt to do a cartilage repair, we have to think about the knee alignment. And this is one of the recent paper in 2020, where the Jacob say that mechanical axis alignment, regardless of physiologic or too high uh, high osteotomy, this improves survivorship in patient undergoing cartilage procedure. So if you do not correct the alignment, your cartilage procedure is bound to fail. That is why whenever you do a cartilage procedure, you must think about the alignment. So this is my protocol for all cart focal cartilage defect. I always check for the alignment. So I do a scanogram. If it is alignment is correct, then I treat the cartilage. If alignment is not incorrect, treatment of the cartilage, uh, treatment, corrective osteotomy, and then treatment of the cartilage lesion. This can be done in the two stage or you can combine the single stage as well. So uh, this slide, say, slide shows the importance of the alignment. So whenever we are treating a cartilage defect, we have to assure that the alignment is correct or not. So this was a 51 year old lady uh, presented to us with uh, knee pain. You know. Actually, she was referred to us with this MRI where it says that there is a cartilage defect. You could see that. Uh, in the sagittal section, there is a big cartilage defect, and she, she also had some osteoarthritic changes on the middle side. So this was her um, alignment uh, X-ray, which says that there was a 10 degree of vir virus and the uh, osteochondral defect on the medial uh, osteochondral defect on the medial compartment. So we did a um, you know in in that case when we are doing a ITVL osteotomy, I I do not do uh, the aggressive method of treatment of uh, you know, cartilage repair. So I just did a microfracture of that uh, defect and we did a um, high TBL osteotomy. And this patient again went on uh, doing well and sees about six months down the line, a uh, significant reduction of the pain, um, you know, uh, reported by this patient. We don't know either this pain reduction is because of the shift, shifting of the weight from the damaged cartilage to the normal one, or this is because of the, the cartilage repair. Uh, the most important one we all know about, again, to emphasize the size of the lesion is very, very important. So whenever there is a focal control lesion, grade three and grade four, we must assess the size of the lesion. We must request our radiologist to give us the size of lesion. This is not only one dimension, it has to be all three dimensions. As I said, the depth of the lesion is equally important to assess the subcontrol bone. So if the lesion is, suppose there is uh, no subcondral injury and the, if the lesion is less than one centimeter, I'll just get away with the microfracture. Uh, if it is between one to four centimeter, I always do a mosaic plasty. If it is somewhere between four to 10 centimeter, I always attempt to do a repair, use that cartilage. And only if that repair fail, then I will suggest for ACI. Since ACI is not available in our country, the patient has to go abroad to get the ACI done. If it is more than 10 centimeter, uh, it's a very, very bad prognosis. The patient has to go for the allogram. But um, uh, we are fortunate enough uh, to have, you know, 99% of our cases between one to four centimeters, sometimes 4.5 centimeter. Very rarely you will have a patient who have bigger than five centimeters of the defect. This is a fortunate part. Another thing I'll take in um, you know, consideration is the, uh, the demand of the patient. Uh, if the patient is low demand and someone who is above uh, 50 years, I do not do aggressive treatment uh, for those patients. Microfracture is my first choice for these patients. In high demand patients, uh, usually the young uh, adults, mosaic plasty is the first choice of mine. So this is a 30-year-old doctor. She was an active lady. She actually sustained an ACL injury and the MCL injury when she fell down from a, a motorbike. When he presented, when she presented to us, uh, there was a focal defect of about eight millimeter. That is what uh, reported by uh, the radiologist, and this was the lesion, eight millimeter lesion. Uh, you know, uh, when we went inside, we found out that there was a uh, about 7.5 uh, uh, millimeters lesion. So since she was very young and active, we decided to do an arthroscopic mosaic plasty in this case. Uh, I do an arthroscopic mosaic plasty when I can manage the lesion with one or two plugs. So if we have to use 
more than two plug then adjusting your arthroscopic mosaic plus is difficult so this has been a mosaic has been harvested make sure that you harvest in full extension of your knee joint then you use your drill bit so that you make the, make the recipient hole uh, you know it has to be matched with the size of the harvested uh, um the plug and once you have done it in this case it was about 12 mm depth uh, the harvested plug so we did a you know a 12 mm reaming and then you just insert uh, if you are doing a single one then you don't need a inserting devices it's just simple take out with the same device with which you have harvested and you just sew it in and then you have a, a you know soft tamp uh, which is available with most most of these devices and you just stamp it in so uh, this is a very simple uh, procedure and uh, you know um, gives an excellent result so only when mosaic plastic is not possible then it is a problem so uh, preferably what um, dr laszlo hangodi said that indication for doing other technique is uh, you know if we cannot address any lesion with the mosaic plastic then you can think about it. so this is another one 21 year old uh, Yeah. It's a big lesion, you know. This was about 4.5 centimeter lesion. Uh, you could see that uh, this was his uh, defect right on the next to the trochlea. So this was a big lesion. We have advised him uh, if he could, you know, uh, try a uh, ACI, uh, which was very very costly. We have spoken to uh, our colleagues in India also if he can they can give us a ACI, but this was not possible. So we gave them a uh, we gave him a second best option that we decided that we'll go ahead with the. mosaic plastic in this particular case you could see that this was a big lesion about uh, when we measured it was about 4 cm it was just adjacent to the trochlea so what we did first uh, we removed the um, we removed the loose body i'll not go into that uh, it's very simple procedure the loose body was removed then the arthrotomy was done and this was the lesion after debridement of all this uh, cartilage so what is another important thing is if it is a chronic case you know you have to go your margin has to be really sharp uh, so that um, it provides uh, you know good weight to the uh, mosaic plastic cartilage so in this case we used uh, four uh, 6.5 mm plugs and then that was able to cover recent the current trend says that it is not uh, um, you know necessary to stack like like this uh, or what hangodi says it has to be compressed with each other if you still have one or 2 mm of gap between these mosaics uh, it will also work there uh, so you can see that this is 18 months uh, follow up you could see at the top one is the pre op uh, mri and the lower one is the post op mri i'm, I'm sorry you could see that the nicely healed um, the plugs and the cartilage has been developing again you can compare in the sagittal view i'll show a bigger picture in which you can see that on your right side this is 18 month the plug plug has nicely incorporated and you could see that the cartilage is very well developed so see in this case with the mosaic we have addressed the subchondral bone as well as uh, the cartilage and this is after 18 month uh, the patient was uh, um, you know almost uh, normal he was having minimal pain and he said that he was able to do everything this is just a 21 year old uh, young patient final few slides on aci to tell you very frankly i do not do aci i, I would definitely listen to some of the other faculties uh aci has to go through a process and the main important problem with the aci is stability of the implanted material so when you put that uh, how you uh, secure the uh, implanted material and the whole development of all these four generation of aci is dependent upon what is going to initially we used to use a you know periosteum then there was a collagen patch and then one is a gel form and then now it has come to a uh you know may see and then so many things uh, developed and probably this is one of the thing that um uh, we are missing in our country uh, hopefully in near future we'll be able to do it but the problem is it is a two stage procedure uh, it is more costly and as i said um, 95% of my patient will not go for you know aci uh, and then its availability is not there in our country at this moment i am very much fascinated by the uh, bmat procedure Uh, which is a bone marrow concentrate which is a one stage procedure and looks very simple i don't have any experience i i'm uh, i know that arumugam uh, does this uh, bmac and then he was saying that is the results are good probably we have to listen to them so to uh, conclude uh, uh, my
my presentation, I'll say that when we treat a coronal lesion, uh, the multifaceted approach to the coronal lesion has to be applied. Either the lesion is focal or diffuse, divided osteochondritis desiccans, identify the status of the subchondral bone, define the age of the patient, which will again give us a guideline. Grade of injury has to be, you know, done. Size of the defect is one single very much important uh, factor of treating all this. And then don't forget a functional demand. So these are again the scientific thing. One extra thing that we have to face in our country is the cost of this procedure and the availability in our country. So if you combine all these things, we have very limited uh, you know, resources to treat this cartilage defect and those are uh, microfractures and the uh, orbs. With this, I'd like to thank MyTech for having me here and giving me an opportunity to share some of my opinions. Thank you very much.